Welcome to Get Better Basketball Live. I'm Coach DeMarco, and today my guest is Coach Ben Murphy, who's going to share out with us on the spread offense. You're not going to want to miss this episode. But before I jump into it, let's take a look at the special offer from Dr. Dish. Get yourself a brand new Dr. Dish all-purpose shooting machine to make your team the best shooters they can be. Mention the GBET BB chat or the Get Better Basketball chat for up to $300 off select Dr. Dish shooting machines. And make sure you check out the all-new Dr. Dish CT Plus to get your team a competitive advantage over opponents. You're going to love this episode with Coach Ben Murphy on the spread offense. I've had an opportunity to take a look at this offense in detail with Coach Murphy. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Another Get Better Basketball Live is up now. Coach Samaka here with Get Better Basketball Live, and I have Coach Ben Murphy joining me here once again. Coach, thanks for joining me today. Uh, thank you, Coach. Happy to be here as always. Going to talk some uh, spread offense today. Love, love talking hoops. We've talked uh, SSGs in the past and actually a number of different topics. Um, but today going to be spread offense. I had a chance to look at uh, some of the notes and stuff ahead of time. I'm really excited uh, about this episode. But could you tell me a little bit about the spread offense and, um, you know, where, where you learned about it? Sure. Um, I started looking at it a few years ago. I was coaching at a small school. I uh, felt like we needed an offense that was um, a little bit different, uh, a little more structure. Um, and a friend of mine who was running that offense at another school had suggested it to me. He said, I should look into it. It's a far out offense, a lot of motion, a lot of cuts. Uh, don't necessarily need to have a lot of guys that can be like, you know, quick off the dribble to make it successful. So I said, okay, that kind of fits, fits the profile of my team. So uh, I gave a look and we really invested some time into it and it, it ended up for a couple of seasons being our base offense and uh, kids really enjoyed, uh, I think, really enjoyed playing uh, playing in it for the couple of years that we made it as our base offense. I'm excited to jump into the diagrams, but before we do, and you kind of spoke to this a little bit, um, what is it that you like so much about this offense and why does it work so well with your team? Sure, sure. I think that um, it's, it's unlike other offenses, I think there's such a premium put on being able to knock down threes. And if you can't knock down threes and the offense kind of gets bogged down. And I think this is one offense where obviously it's helpful to have shooting that's useful in any offense, but I don't think it's as um, much a problem if you don't have, you know, two or three knockdown shooters on your roster. I th still think there are ways uh, to make this offense work and to make, make your scoring kind of easy and available. Puts a lot of pressure on the rim puts a lot of pressure on teams to uh, decide how they're going to guard cuts and screens um, and and handoffs. Um, and I think once you get a sense of how teams are going to read those, then the game becomes easier. There's actually, it's a kind of a streamlined thing. You, there's less for kids to think about because there's only so many ways that people can, can defend against the offense. So I just, I liked it for those reasons. It doesn't really depend on elite athletes or elite shooting um, to make, to make it successful. Love what I'm hearing with the the cutting and, and the screening and the, and the movement uh, in this offense. And just one last question is um, thinking about sort of the profile of a team. Is this something you can run uh, with a smaller team, a bigger team? Do you need to have a certain type of team um, or is it pretty flexible where it's interchangeable and you can use different types of players to run this offense? I think it's very flexible. Um, I think the more that you run it, the more you can figure out where there's little places and notches where you can get a little bit more efficient or creative with it. Um, but I don't think there's a certain type of team that could run it. I can see ways where, heck, you could run it with three big guys and two guards if you really wanted to. We can kind of talk about that when the diagrams come up. But um, I think that there's definitely ways of kind of molding it to make it fit your team. Um, I, we ran it with four guards and one big kid, which is kind of the usual. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to do it, I think, and still be successful. Because when you get into it, you really need you need like two guys that can really handle the ball and then three guys that can kind of cut hard and make good decisions. And if you've got that, then you can at least make the offense function. Yeah, no, I had a chance to look at it. Like I said, I'm excited to, you know, dive deeper into it. And I even love the options when teams – overplay on the wing, waving, waving the player through. And I know you're going to jump into some of that stuff. So 
Um, let's take a look at it. All right, so just to start off with, uh, so this is my presentation on the spread offense. Uh, if, coaches, if you want to ever contact me, my info is at the bottom there, uh, my email and uh, my handle on Twitter. If anybody who has any questions, would be happy to answer those just in case we don't uh, don't cover something today or we have follow-up questions, we'll be happy to answer those later. Uh, whenever, whenever folks want to get a hold of me, they can do that those two ways. All right, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, Coach, was just kind of the benefits of, of taking this offense and trying to use it. Uh, like I kind of mentioned before, I think it puts a lot of pressure on the defense to protect the rim. Um, it's not a huge uh, emphasis on on outside shooting, like I mentioned, so I think you can survive without a ton of shooting. Uh, it's unique. It's got some some Princeton elements to it, some triangle elements to it. So if you're a coach that likes those couple of types of offenses, that's those are those are popular. It's just kind of got some some pieces of both of those in there. Uh, so if coaches enjoy those type of offenses, they might enjoy this one too. Um, we talked about the the shooters not being uh, completely essential. I think that if you're a team that wants to control tempo, so like uh, by by meaning can you know slowing it down a little bit and kind of playing a little more um, conservatively because maybe you're undersized or you're an underdog. I think it can be a great um, a tempo control kind of offense where you really emphasize and trying to get to the rim and trying to get easy buckets um, and and taking care of the ball. I think that another reason why I liked it is because you can t make small kind of changes in spacing, um, and then that way you can use it against the zone. I think there's really easy ways to get your best players um, a lot of touches within it. So it's not just a motion offense where everybody's touching the ball equally. I think you can find there's some pretty easy ways to get your better players more touches and the guys that you want to take more shots, you know, get the ball in their hands a little bit more. And I th think that when teams get the hang of it, uh, it's tough for the defense to choose correctly because there's a pretty solid counter for everything that defense tries to take away. So like if they're taking away one thing, they're giving you something else. And once your team realizes what are they giving us rather than seeing what they're taking away, uh, it's really hard for, to let the defense choose, choose right. Um, and I just like it because I think that you don't, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I think that if you get five guys that can really run this smoothly, um, it can, it can, really get you some easy baskets, even if you don't have it overly, uh, even as a lesser talented team. Uh, I, I put uh, Stephen F. Austin in, in parentheses there because they made, uh, when Brad Underwood was coaching them a few years back and they made a run to the title, uh, they actually lost to Notre Dame, I believe, in overtime. And this was their base offense. And, you know, they didn't probably have the best five guys on the floor, but they had the best offense on the floor. And it, it wasn't even close, I, in my opinion. And uh, I got frustrated down the stretch watching that game because they actually went away from it uh, and and didn't end up beating Notre Dame. But I was like begging for them, I'm like, go back to it. <laughs> it works. Make it happen. So uh, just, you know, five guys working together in this can really uh, be pretty deadly, even if there's not they're not as individually talented as maybe some of their near opponents might be. Coach, I love the um, the last two bullet points there <clears> that you I mean, it's all great stuff, but. Um, you know, tough for defenses to choose, right? And I see that with um, some of the actions and the movement and the cuts that you make in this offense. But also your comments there about the whole um, being greater than the sum of its parts. And I think especially for high school coaches, they can really connect to and relate to that. I mean, college too, and you could go through all levels, to be honest. But a lot of high school coaches that will follow this and watch this uh, episode. And, you know, I, I think that speaks to a lot of them. They have probably five players who are kind of maybe pretty equal and um, you know, they don't have a superstar ISO player, which is probably, probably a good thing because that's not really my favorite thing to watch, but um, I think they can, this really speaks to those coaches. So as we go through this, I think um, it'll make sense, you know, um, and they'll, they'll see how all five players are, are able to get involved in this offense. So, it's not perfect, uh, but it is good. So some some stuff to think about is that it to install it um, takes a while. Uh, it took us a good part of our summer that we installed it to to really I thought get it down smoothly. And then you know you're always learning something in wrinkles. And if I had to run it again, there's probably about you know three or four more things I would do differently and better and and to make it more efficient. But the time investment to get it installed is pretty heavy because it's not. It's not your typical pass and cut motion offense. It's a little bit different than that. So if you've not been involved in any sort of Princeton or triangle offenses, those kind of elements are the cuts and spacing can be a little bit weird at first. Um, I think if you do this, you can't really have a plan B 
like you can't have some backup offense that you're going to go to when it's clunky because that is really what made it work for us. I basically said, this is the offense that we're running. And we took it to a tournament after a week and we were terrible. Um, and the, for the first day we played three games, we got smoked in all three of them. We ran it poorly and I had three seniors looking at me like, what are, what are we doing? Uh, and I just said, just, it's going to work. Just stick with it. It's fine. It'll work. And then by the end of the, the camp, we had, we won like six games the next day. And then we won a, like a, our first round playoff game in that, in that weekend ended up losing in overtime in our second game. And so it was like, by the time it was done, they were like, holy cow. My point guard looked at me, he goes, I think I scored double digits in every game. And I don't think I've taken a shot outside the paint um, just because of the cutting and the spacing was, was um, really helpful to get him to the rim. Uh, it's not elite spacing, even though it's called a spread offense. When you see it, there are offenses, but people are spread out a little further. So the name doesn't always obviously match. Um, and if you don't like, it does kind of have a slower pace to it. So if you are a coach that really likes to push the pace and get the first good shot that you can get, it sometimes it can get you that, but it sometimes bogs down a little bit. Um, sometimes also it'll get, you'll end up with some mid range looks. And I know that depending on who you are as a coach, you might be okay with that. You might be not okay with that. You might be partially okay with that, depending on who's shooting it. Um, but it does give up, you know, the defense does concede a lot of like foul line area jumpers. And I know sometimes some coaches aren't fans of that. So just some things that are like, you know, it's not perfect. So to start off with, you know, your alignment is, it looks a lot like a Princeton, uh, you know, setup. you have your two guards up top, your forwards along the free throw line extended. And your post player is uh, high and weak side. Um, so if you had the ball uh, on the wing getting to three in this diagram, you would uh, you would you would have five opposite uh, opposite elbow. So that's the perfect spacing that you'd want there. Really, nobody uh, should be below the free throw line. We want to leave the free throw. Uh, you want to leave the basket un unguarded so we can attack it off of our cuts. So. This is, again, this is my personal preference as to who goes where. Um, I think everybody needs to know that five position, not just the big. I'll talk about why that is in a second, because uh, I think there's a lot of advantages to having multiple guys that you can put there. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I think your best post player should actually be that second, the, the guy who ends up being the second cutter. So the guy who's like on the weak side furthest from the ball ends up being a second cutter. And he actually gets a lot of good post-up opportunities. And so you're big should actually, it's unconventional, but should probably be starting on the perimeter if you want to post him up in the low post. He's going to get more low post opportunities than the guy that's standing at the elbow. Um, and then your weakest shooter, I think, should be that first cutter. So maybe it's a guard, but it's your probably your third best guard as far as shooting is concerned. Um, and then quite simply, I would put my best two players on the ball side wing and slot to start off with because they're going to have the ball in their hands a little bit more if you if you started like that the way the offense flows that ball unless something strange happens is probably going to be in one and two's hands more more often than not so i would just put my best two ball handlers and shooters in that in that particular position so um the the first cutter is is never stuck on the perimeter so that the reason why i wanted to put a guy that, you know who's a weaker shooter there is because most of his shots aren't going to come from there he's going to be cutting off of a screen Screen, he's going to be getting to the rim. He's going to be finishing at the rim. As long as he can do that, he's fine. And like I said before, the second cutter has a lot of post-up chances in the possession. Um, and the ball stays in the, in the player's hands that are kind of the best at handling it more often, which is nice if you can get a lead, you can keep it in their hands, they get fouled, they can go to the free throw line, et cetera. So it's a lot of good reasons to kind of keep people in positions to succeed. Um, so it's not flashy, but it does get the job done. So this is your basic, you know, action to start it off. You want to hit the wing um, with a pass. Um, and then the timing of it is like the two should be going as soon as he sees the ball heading towards three. He's cutting down and, and through. Uh, he can go over top of five or underneath him. doesn't really matter. If he doesn't get a post up, two is scooting all the way out to the corner there. Uh, four is running. should be in a straight line with five anyway. And he runs straight at five. And again, he can take it underneath or over the top. And he's going to end up on the block. So what three really should have is looking at two for a layup on the cut, looking at four for a layup on the post up. Uh, and if he doesn't have those, then we get into, then we get into our reversal and our continuity. But this is part of the reason why I love the offenses is, is, is the defense can't guard the rim. They can't sag off of you that much. And they got to guard two layup cuts 
uh, with no help defense. And if they screwed up once, you're giving up a layup if your defense is falling asleep. So, you know, you may not get that more than two or three times a game, but hey, that's that's a couple of layups. We'll take those and we can get them. And, you know, I know you mentioned, Coach, uh, the, the shooting piece. And I love I love talking with coaches and, and like your wheels start spinning and you're watching this. And I can already <laughs> see teams that, you know, that two player makes that <clears throat> cut through and their player is going to start to cheat. And it's two steps. And if they are someone who can shoot, and I know you, the good thing about this offense, you don't have to have great three-point shooters, but maybe you do have someone that can shoot two steps oh, yeah. and they just fade back to the ball and – they could be knocking yep. down a shot, you know, if they cheat on it. So if they switch, you're going to get advantages. And I know you're going to get into some of that stuff later on. But um, it's it's just amazing, you know, with these two cuts that there's a lot of things you can do off of it. And I know you've, you've sort of spoken to that. And I'm yeah. sure you'll get into some of that stuff later on, too. Yeah, and this is just kind of the base model here, right? There's a lot of ways to finagle it so that if you do have shooters, obviously you can take advantage of the cheats. So your basic continuity after that, you know, you got your guys who have cut through to the corner and you see that there's a real heavy overload to that right-hand side. So the ideal is we want to get it to that high post, you know, the opposite side elbow as quick as possible. And surprisingly enough, that that pass from wing to opposite elbow is actually there quite a bit because five's man will sag to help those cuts and not let because the, co- the opposing coaches don't want to give up layups. And so they want to sag off of there. Well, okay, thank you. We'll take that. We want that direct line from five or to get the ball to five. We can get it. If we have to go three to one to five, like make a couple of passes to make that happen. Like that's fine. But in at worst case scenario, we can dribble into a ball screen on that opposite elbow. That's fine too. But the, the ideal is let's throw that across to that elbow and then we'll start our cutting action. And so when we do that and five touches the ball on this opposite elbow, one is on a sprint. So ideally one would be taken off at the same time as pass is happening and you get a little blind pig handoff here where you're kind of cutting behind the defense and getting some layups um so the, the goal is to shift the defense all the way over to right and then and then get it back without any help side weak side defense to to lay up on the backhand side coach so, you, you just a quick question you mentioned um uh personnel and that you like everyone to know that five spot uh with yeah. your team are there times that you put your best player there or you put a smaller guy there or just yep. for matchup purposes or, you know, so what, that's what one like of the to... things that's one of the things that I didn't do at first, but I, if I had to go back and do it, I totally would uh, do it more. Um, we had a couple guys and it was our bigs that we put there just for simplicity to start, but I would encourage coaches that are going to take on this offense is to put as many guys there as you can, because this provides some tremendous opportunities for isolations. Uh, if you can, if they drop off this guy and you got a guy who can just catch and one dribble drive and finish, I think that's helpful. So I think like you can put your point guard there. You can put any of your top players there. I think is a, it's a dangerous place to catch a ball in the high post um, because as you can see, kind of as you go down through the bullet points, if he makes that catch, he can just keep it and rip and go opposite, you know, and score in one basket. He can get that high low chance. So like that's the thing that I love that I don't think a lot of teams take advantage of enough is this four man comes over here and posts up right and. and we don't get him a touch. Well, that's fine. If you zip it across to five, five typically has a, a quick pass down here to four because whoever's guarding four, if they fronted him, you can just get a pass across, pass diagonal down, and that's a nice high-low chance, right? If, if that, if that, if they've beaten him to the high, to the post. So sometimes we tell our guys like, let him, let him beat you to the post. Like, let that guy feel like he's got you covered. We're just gonna make two passes, and it's gonna be a layup. So the team goes from feeling like they have you sealed off to you. They're giving up a layup on the backhand side. Um, there's a DHO chance for this this point guard coming off, the, working with the five. There's a DHO chance for the two guard if uh, if he doesn't, if the first guy doesn't take it. Um, and five can also keep it. So do the old Draymond Green kind of take the handoff and kind of walk right down the middle and score it. We would get that once or twice a game. The kid we had playing here was by far our worst shooter. And he let us in field goal percentage the first time we we did it because every shot he'd take is an uncontested layup. So we shot like sixty. So he shot like sixty five percent from the field uh, because everything was from from five feet and in and it was generally just catching people off guard because you know you hand it off and you hand it off and you hand it off and then that fourth or fifth time you don't. Everybody's gone this way and you're you're walking down the middle for a layup and the, <laughs> it's, it's, those it's, those are the, those are the shots we love to get. We love to get those, right? Especially from kids that aren't great shooters, right? So the kid that I played the five for us was not a great shooter. I wouldn't want him taking shots outside of the paint. And so 
And I told him that and he knew it. So uh, that was his thing. We just thought like, if you can't get a clean handoff, if they're jamming that up, that's fine. That means the help defense is going past you. They can go. Um, so the basic continuity would be if um, if one gets this ball here off of the handoff, which is the thing that happens the most often, right? And he turns the corner, we're obviously trying to get a layup or maybe a drop off to to five on a, on like a little pocket pass. But if we don't have that, it's pretty simple. He would just kind of retreat, dribble, bounce it back to the wing. Two's already kind of came over. Three's come up. Four's come up. They're kind of everybody's following that same uh, string, and then we've we essentially we respace to the opposite side, right? So one would be one would have the ball bounced out to the wing. Two would kind of come up to the slot. Three's popping up. Four's popping up. And our spacing returns. Five would just go to the opposite elbow, and we've got the offense looking looking pretty good again. Spacing looking pretty good again. So <clears throat> there's three entries to it. Um, the one that's kind of most popular, and again, you'll see it again in, in Princeton offenses as well, is just that dribble handoff and the the what they would call forwards out in a Princeton offense, right, where your weak side guys are exchanging, where the handoff's happening on one side. And that's just to get three or four guys moving um, and start the and start the uh, the defense moving rather than just pass making one pass and having nobody really move or one person move. You know, you get three or four defenders moving and then you hit them with those cuts. They're a lot more effective. Um, the one, the one that we run most often, especially in transition was this one here. Um, that was a dribble at, and we called it wave because it was, a, it was a read from the point guard. Basically, if he didn't feel like he could comfortably get the ball to two, he would just, he would literally give him a wave and tell him to get through. And so two would cut and basically hide like underneath the basket behind the backboard. Three would make the same cut as he always does. And then what two would do is just run up the lane line, basically, and get a screen from four, a screen from five, and, and probably catch somewhere in this left-hand slot area. And he would have a chance to shoot it, rip baseline and go. Um, worst case scenario, I'll play a two-man game real quick with the five. Um, and that was really good if you had, like, one of your best players as your two, right? Uh, if you can wave him through and create a – a two-man game where you're in isolation for him on the opposite side, and that was that was helpful. And the one shot you would actually get on this uh, sometimes was with four screening here and just slipping because he usually ends up there anyway. Uh, you would get that sometimes where as soon as this guy runs up, four slips to the spot he's normally in anyway, and, uh, and we get some buckets there. Um, one uh, the fun part here this this slot to post thing. Uh, the diagram I have here is just kind of basically two rim cuts from your from your slots to the rim, um, and then your wings replace. But you don't have to do that. There's I'll, I'll, in one of the other slides later. Um, you can do a number of things off of this with screening action, whatever you really prefer as a coach. This is a basic action. It's really hard to guard because you know teams aren't used to guarding one one pass and in, in, in cut. And now they got to guard two you know two guys rim running at the same time. Uh, so our rule was if we went direct to the post that he was just to uh, to get it out of his fans as quick as possible. We kind of wanted to hot potato it out of there um, really to the first guy he saw was open. So it might be these guys cutting rim. It might be the guys curling to the top. Uh, just whoever he saw open first should be should be getting the ball. So as long as that ball was in and out of that post spot quickly, we felt like we probably had a pretty good advantage. One, two quick passes. And we felt like no matter what, we'd probably get something good out of that, whether it was on the cut or the replacement. So the DHO exchange, again, looks a lot like the chin series. It gets the defense moving early. That first cutter is more likely to be open if you get this action early. Uh, this is not something we did enough. I would do more of this if I had to. We did a little stagnant where we would just pass wing and then cut, which is okay. But again, if you get your defense moving and then make that first cut after it hits the wing pass, then I guess that uh, that would be that would probably get your guys open a little bit more because the defense is moving and then they have to defend back screens. It's just tougher to defend. On that uh, on that dribble at um, again, I would use this if I had a matchup. If I had a guy that I knew really was hard to guard, I would take my best player. Or if we just needed a basket, we would go. Okay, I'm going to put my best guy here. I'm going to wave him through. He's cutting off at two screens plus, you know, your three is cutting through there. So it's a lot of traffic on that that left hand lane that he's going to come up through, and he's going to get open. It's just a matter of whether he's got enough space to shoot it or drive it or play a two man game. So, um, and another thing that we got in transition quite a bit um, 
inadvertently is on this wave, two would cut through and his defender would kind of just turn his back and jog with him. And our point guard would kind of just meander down into the swing like he wasn't going to do anything. And then he would just turn the corner and go. And we got that a lot where, especially in transition, where your defense is backpedaling anyway. And so you kind of like slow up, like you're just going to wave the guy through. All of a sudden, there's no defense on this entire side of the court. And our point guard was pretty smart. He would just turn, duck his shoulder and turn the corner. We got eat some easy buckets off of that. So, But that comes with kind of seeing the offense and realizing what was there. We kind of got that on accident the first time. And I just told my point guard, hey, if you can get that, go get that. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a nice draft drive possibility. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, like the slot to post thing, I think, has some huge – uh, possibilities depends on what coaches prefer depends on what their teams are able to do um you could have both guys cut uh, to the rim that's kind of your basic one with your ring wings replacing um you could cross screen uh or um like into a high low right so you or you could flare screen for shooters so those are the two ones on the uh, sorry flare and pin are the ones on the bottom so your the flare screen is the one I like the most, especially if you got some guys that if you're one or two can shoot, because that's really would be really hard to guard, especially if the three or the four slip those screens after they after they pin them. Um, if you're one and your two can shoot, that's a really nice quick hitter. They'll have a lot of space off after that. And then the, the three and four can make those rim cuts afterwards. So you got pressure at the perimeter and you got pressure um, on, on the rim as well. Um and worst case scenario, if you got this is a benefit of putting a guy who can play at the five. If you just throw it to the five and you run all that action just as distraction, basically, and he can just rip an ISO and, and play play from foul line to to free throw in and just get everybody else out of the way. Uh if you got a five that can play and you think you got a matchup, you can exploit. That's a great place to exploit it. So um Again, I this is my personal preference. If I had to go do it again, I would I would do this differently. I would put uh, my two best players probably in the one and the two spots, and I would put probably my my third best player, or at least I would make a lot of people from comfortable with it. But I would put a, a I think a higher skilled offensive player uh, there than I did previously, and that's not to knock the guys that were playing it. Like I said, they shot a high percentage, but I think there's so much uh, pressure that that puts on the defense because you can't sag off of that guy. You can't help on the cuts as much when that guy's in the high post. Um, whereas if it's a weaker offensive player there, they can stop those cuts from happening, stop those rim cuts from being successful. Um, but, you know, I think there's advantages, right? So it's like if you could hide a weaker player there. And all that guy's going to be able to do is catch and decide to hand off or not, right? And that's not a complicated job. And you could also rest a player there, right? So if, he, if a guy's got – if he's gassed, if he's got – you know, three fouls and you don't want to be running them all over the court, or if he's a defensive minded player and you want him to have tons of energy on defense. Okay. Well, let's go play that high post for a few possessions. Cause it's not a lot of movement. It's just, again, it's a matter of catching and being able to decide like, where does it go next? And, and really just being a facilitator and making sure that the ball doesn't stick there for all that long. So I love the high post uh, touch. I think that it doesn't get used enough in, in basketball just period, no matter what offense you're using. I love a high post touch and I don't, it doesn't matter to me how you, how you get it there. I think that getting it there creates a lot of problems. And I think with there, with most systems being four out and five out, even in your four out systems, more often than not, the post player is playing weak side dunker um, and not in the high post. And I love a good high post touch. Like I said, they can hit that keeper. Um, like they can fake the handoff and go like Draymond. If they're a good uh you know, player, they can just rip and score in one dribble or two. If they can catch and shoot and you're okay with that as a coach, there's foul line jumpers aplenty to be had. They can hit that high low. They can hit the flare or the pin down. Um, if they're a really good shooter, those two cuts, um, and you can hold up, they can stop those cuts, just pin their defenders in and the five can pop for an elevator. Um, there's also wrinkles in there to get them a lob if your guy can leap a little bit. Um, and again, as long as he's decent in a, in a dribble handoff or a two man game, uh, any, anybody can play there. It's just, I think, uh, as a coach, it's to your advantage to figure out just how many guys you can, you can put in there. Uh, Cause I think there's huge advantages being, to being able to do that. Um, 
So yeah, I would use a keeper anytime that that they were trying to blow up our handoffs. I think that's that's that goes without saying, right? If you hand off three or four times, they're gonna start blowing that up, especially if they're giving up layups. And so then you just don't hand it off and you cut to the rim and your five is all of a sudden scoring. Um the high low is the again, you can go five to four when that when he seals off. And then that flare, um, as you can see in that bottom diagram, instead of four making that cut, he can actually just pin x5 in and you can skip it to five and, and shoot it um <laughs> creighton as uh, a throwback so doug mcdermott actually used to run this at creighton and they would put doug mcdermott at the five and they would pin him in and you can he, we all know what kind of shooter he is and he would just take two steps back and and that's really tough to guard obviously if you got a guy who can shoot i think that speaks to your point earlier too about the player you can put in this five spot and having different players that can play there because you can do some Different things like the flair, as as you mentioned. Um, either just some specials or counters that, you know, if you're a coach that that likes those sorts of things. Um, I ran this for two years and we just started in that second year, starting putting in some of these uh these wrinkles. Um, if you're a coach that likes, again, if you want to isolate a good player, instead of making that second cutter go through, um, you can just have the first cutter go through and then three instead of cutting through, just goes corner. You get it back to one, and then now you have this this player coming off a wide pin down, and they have two thirds of the court to play a, a two man game with with five, um, which is uh, I like our chances there two on two with half the court uh, undefended. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a Princeton coach um, and you like point away, um, you know once you throw to that five again, you don't have the two run through. You just have them cut corner, and there's your there's your away screen and your your convergence and your read, right? One guy to the rim, one guy to the perimeter, and you can play out of that. So you can make it look a lot like Princeton if you want to. Um, this delay game, I really like, especially for um, teams that are kind of limited with ball handlers or if it's a big, big mismatch. If you're in a state that plays without a shot clock, I want a shot clock in my state. We don't have one, but look, if that's the rules and you want to play by those and you want to, you want to melt the possessions, Go ahead and do this, right? So uh, Dana Altman runs this. He calls it 12. And the reason why he calls it that is because one and two are the only guys touching the ball. So it's, you know, you get your cutters running through. You you get a ball screen. Try to turn the corner. You don't have it. You bounce it back. You kind of ping pong it back and forth between one and two. Three and four cut. We repeat. So it keeps the ball in the hands of one and two. Keeps them playing a two-man game. Keeps the ball out of guys' hands that you really can't shoot it. Um, and it moves the ball back and forth and it wears out the defense. So I think there's, a, it's again, it's not flashy, but I think there's a lot to be said for like, you know, if you're playing at a small school with limited, with, with limited talent, or you're not quite confident and kind of letting four guys touch the ball down the stretch, you go to something like this and milk the lead a little bit and you keep the you kind of, you, it's, a, it's a safety valve, but I think there's, there's a lot of value in that. And again, versus a zone, like I was mentioning before, um, it doesn't take a lot to switch. You kind of just, if you can kind of see the way the diagram is, you just kind of tilt where everybody is. So it looks a little bit more like, uh, almost like a shuffle offense uh, set up, right? And talking old school offenses, right? Um, and the cuts are actually fairly similar. Um, so you would just kind of shift all your guards over a little bit. Um, and they would actually make the same cuts just from a different angle. You know, your three would still end up in the opposite corner. Your four would still up end up on the block. And the only difference is your five would just would just flare screen the top of that zone. So whoever's protecting that, because there's almost always somebody that's going to drop to that nail. You would just have your five seal in. And what you'd be looking for is a quick ball reversal to two, and then he can attack this seam here. And so what you really want to do is leave this defender who is guarding kind of that right-hand corner, is kind of leave him on an island where he's got to decide to step up and guard X2. Um, and if he does, then we've got some options. We can drop it off to four. We can kick it back out across, whatever. So there's not a whole lot of switches you have to do. Um, it's just that that screen has to happen a little earlier. And you typically can't reverse it from one to five because there's almost always somebody that's going to be in that line of sight. Um, these are just some kind of some helpful links if people are interested in those. Um, so uh, Zach Boisvert, uh Jordan Sperber, and Jeff Perry had all put out great stuff on YouTube um, that folks can look into that are just basically quick hitters and, and things that are based off of these offenses. If they want to run it and they got the base stuff down, things to um, things to take a look at. 